Hi everyone, this lesson's called Altering Cell Metabolism. It focuses on uh, certain chemicals and the effects that they can have on cells. And the key idea that it addresses is that chemicals can interfere with cell metabolism. So I'm going to start off by talking about poisons. And the first poisonous chemical is the carbon monoxide molecule. Pretty simple molecule made of a carbon atom and one oxygen atom. And this complex that you see here is actually the haemoglobin protein complex which carries oxygen in red blood cells. Now here we have an oxygen molecule and the oxygen is what normally binds to haemoglobin and is carried around the body. The reason why carbon monoxide is dangerous is because it can actually displace the oxygen and take up the space where oxygen would normally bind and that it's actually far more efficient at binding with haemoglobin than oxygen is therefore rendering haemoglobin useless and not able to carry oxygen around the body. This slide shows some examples of some other poisonous chemicals so here we have the one we've just talked about carbon monoxide and some others that you may or may not have heard of we have cyanide which is a poisonous chemical Hydrogen sulfide, also this one has a particular smell, it's also known as rotten egg gas. And barbiturates, which are a group of chemicals. Now, all of these chemicals are poisonous and they all, in some way or another, affect respiration. Now, as we know, respiration is a critical process for cell survival because it's the process by which they produce energy. Now, these poisons are able to inhibit enzymes and prevent respiration from occurring which is what makes them so dangerous. Now on the previous slide you would have heard me use the term inhibit and that's because the poisons that we've talked about are inhibitors and they're either competitive or non-competitive. So just revising what competitive inhibitors and non-competitive inhibitors are and how they work. A competitive inhibitor has a similar shape to the substrate and that means that it is able to bind to the active site of the enzyme which prevents the substrate from binding to the enzyme and therefore affecting the process from occurring. A non-competitive inhibitor binds elsewhere on the enzyme causing the enzyme to change shape so that its active site now has a different shape that will no longer be complementary to the substrate and therefore it renders the enzyme ineffective. So the poisons that we've looked at act in either of these two ways as competitive inhibitors or non-competitive inhibitors and that's why they are chemicals that can alter cell metabolism. The next chemical example is antibiotics which I'm sure you've all heard of. Now let's just break this term down anti meaning working against, and bio, meaning living. So antibiotics are antibacterial chemicals. They work against bacteria, which is, I've got an example of a bacterial cell here. Now, there's several different types of antibiotics. Um, our knowledge of them has developed over the years, and we've developed lots and lots of different types. So... They can act in different ways. That's what I'm showing you with this diagram. That We have antibiotics that can target bacteria by focusing on preventing the cell wall from properly being synthesised. So here are a range of different examples of antibiotics that work on preventing the cell wall from being synthesised properly. There's also some antibiotics here that are chemicals that prevent nucleic acid synthesis from occurring properly. So they prevent the uh, chromosome of the bacterium from being replicated, which is obviously going to inhibit the growth of the bacteria. And these types here are antibiotic chemicals that focus on preventing protein synthesis from taking place. Now, this says 50S subunit and 30S subunit. That refers to the ribosome. So these antibiotics target the 50S subunit of the bacterial ribosome and these antibiotics focus on the 30S subunit 
of the bacterial ribosome. That's probably more information than we actually need to know. I guess the summary from this slide is that antibiotics can either target cell wall synthesis, nucleic acid synthesis, or protein synthesis. And by preventing one of those things happening, we can prevent the growth of bacteria, which means we can stop those bacteria from potentially making us sick. I've got another example of a chemical here, nerve chemicals. Now, nerve chemicals affect exactly that. They, they target the nervous system of living things. And the example that I'm going to use are insecticides. So you can see here we've got a crop duster where a farmer will use the, the chemical to spray the crops and prevent insects from ruining their crops. So how these insecticides work is that they affect the transmission of nerve messages inside of the, the insect. Uh, it's a chemical that is an inhibitor, again, a chemical inhibitor of an enzyme called acetylcholine esterase. And that enzyme basically breaks down a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine, which is a complex way of saying the transmission of nerve messages. So these nerve chemicals, such as insecticides, are ones that work by stopping the transmission of nerve messages and effectively killing insects. Now this next example is bacterial toxins. These are chemicals that are produced by bacterial cells. And the first example that we're going to talk about is a toxin produced by the Bacillus thuringiensis bacterium, or the Bt bacterium. Now, it's an interesting one because it actually ties in with the example that we looked at, looked at on the previous page where we were looking at how nerve toxins are used on insects, such as insecticides. Uh, the thing is about the Bacillus thuringiensis, the Bt bacterium, is that it actually produces a toxin that kills insects, as you can see the result over here. So what scientists have been able to do is isolate the gene from the Bt bacterium that codes for the toxin that kills insects, and then using genetic engineering techniques, insert that gene into the crop, so by putting it into cells of the crop in which they are growing. And then the pest obviously dies when it feeds on the plant because the plant is producing the bacterial toxin. And that is called using genetic engineering to produce pest resistant crops. The obvious advantage of that is that farmers are no longer needing to spray their crops with insecticides, saving them money and saving the consumers from consuming those chemicals. Another example, which I've got hiding down under here, is a bacterial toxin which I reckon you would have all heard of. The bacterium that we're talking about is the plague. Now, the plague is the, these bacterial cells here. These are plague bacteria, and they produce one of the most deadly chemicals to humans. So another example there of a bacterial toxin. Okay, heavy metals. Uh, right, uh, oh, hang on a second, sorry, not that type of heavy metal. This type of heavy metal. Okay, we have two examples here, lead and cadmium. Now, these metals are very dangerous in if they accumulate in our bodies. Basically the reason why is that these metals act as non-competitive inhibitors of important enzymes in metabolic pathways within cells. The aim of this slide is to basically give you some examples of chemicals that humans have used throughout history and the benefits of those chemicals, or the desired benefits, and some of the costs which have come about, which may not have been known about it at the, in the beginning. 
but have since been discovered from using those chemicals. The first example that I've got here is the chemical radium. Now, back a while ago, radium, which is a radioactive element, uh, was once thought to be healthy to bathe in. Uh, it was used for numerous medical applications. It was used by painters to manufacture luminous paint. Um, unfortunately, the dangers of radium were not discovered until many of the people who had handled it had actually developed cancer. Uh, because it's a radioactive chemical, the radiation from radium had caused mutations in cells. Next example is mercury. Uh, mercury has many uses. The major benefit is that it's the only liquid metal in existence. Um, You've probably heard of it and you probably know it's reasonably toxic as the element but the main danger is that if it actually escapes into the environment what happens there is that bacteria convert it into a, a nasty and poisonous chemical called methylmercury uh, and when this enters the food chain it accumulates as it moves through the, through the food chain uh, and uh, gets to a point where it can cause serious illness and uh, disrupting metabolic pathways. So, yeah, mercury, a highly toxic chemical and quite dangerous. DDT is an example of an insecticide, uh, but it has a similar effect to how what I was just explaining about mercury. It's a cumulative poison. So it's a really effective insecticide, but the problem is it's been banned now in developed countries because it accumulates in a food chain and the higher order consumers end up receiving most of it as a poison. Uh, the dilemma that they have is that in, in developing countries it is really effective at, at controlling malaria because it's so good at killing mosquitoes. So a bit of an ethical issue there. Should they use it? Shouldn't they use it? Next example you'd be familiar with are fertilisers. The obvious benefit of those is that we can put them on our plants at gardens and farmers use them on their crops to increase their yield. The problem with fertilisers arises when the chemicals get into the waterways and we have this problem called eutrophication where algal blooms are formed and can cause some serious problems in waterways uh, for the environment. The next example is thalidomide. Some of you might be familiar with it. Uh, it's a really tragic example, this one. Thalidomide was a morning sickness medication used in the 1960s. It was there to prevent nausea in pregnant women. Uh, the problem was uh, it did a really great job at preventing morning sickness. However, the children from whom, whose mothers took thalidomide during pregnancy were born with birth defects and it was pretty soon after that that they discovered it was affected, that they were affected due to the use of thalidomide and that chemical was instantly taken off the market. Pretty clear cut example of food preservatives. Um, chemicals such as sulphur dioxide can be used to uh, preserve our foods, make them last longer and therefore we have more food and for a longer period of time. The problem is that particular people develop particular allergic reactions to certain preservatives, which can obviously be a potential issue. Difficult to weigh up the costs and benefits of this next one, which is immunosuppressive drugs. Now, immunosuppressive drugs are vital for organ transplant recipients because what they do is they, exactly as the title implies, they suppress the immune system. And when someone has an organ transplant, they're receiving an organ from another person. And the body's job is to actually recognise that it's not from their own body. And the immune system will then fight it off as something foreign. Now, in the case of a, an organ transplant, we don't want that to happen. So the immunosuppressive prevents the rejection of that new organ, which is exactly what we want it to do. The problem that we have when people are on immunosuppressives is that their immune system is low because it's being suppressed, therefore they're much more prone to infections and can get sick a lot easier due to a low immune system. 
Contraceptives is the last example of a chemical that humans have used that I've got here. Still in use today, the pill is one that springs to mind as a commonly used contraceptive. The obvious benefit is population control and prevention of unwanted pregnancies. But the cost is potential side effects. Different people react differently to different contraceptives. So that's all the examples that I've got for you um, of chemicals which humans have used over history and their benefits and costs. Uh, there's obviously many more examples of chemicals used by humans. Some of them may have detrimental effects. Some of those effects we might not even know of yet. So that's the end of our lesson on altering cell metabolism and the different types of chemicals and the effects that they can have and how they have those effects. Hopefully it's been of some use for you. Thanks for watching and uh, see you next time.